when you compare the Buddha's teachings to the other teachings that were being taught at his time, one thing immediately stands out, which is how humble the main topic of his teachings was. Other teachers were talking about the universe as a whole, whether it was eternal, not eternal, finite, infinite, or just the nature of the human personality. Is it is your body the same as your life force, or is the body something separate? How would you describe an awakened person? What are the basic building blocks of the universe? Those kinds of issues, big issues, abstract issues. The Buddha, on the other hand, taught something very immediate, concrete, and quite humble. The problem of suffering, the problem of pain. Something that we don't like to look at, something that we tend to run away from, something we could wish we would just get out of the way so we could deal with the larger issues of life. But the Buddha had the insight to see that dealing with this very immediate, very humble issue really does open you up to the larger issues of life. Because even though the main topic of his teachings was suffering, it wasn't limited just to that. What he saw, though, was that if you focus on this one issue, all the other issues get cleared up. Either you find that they get answered, or that you realize that they weren't worth, worth answering to begin with. It's important that we realize this as we practice, because some people say that it's just a, such a small selfish issue to be dealing with. Why can't we be dealing with the larger issues like compassion and the world as a whole, the interconnectedness of everybody? That's because those issues they tend to be abstract and quite vague, and they really don't get to the main issue in life is why is it that the mind creates suffering for itself? These are the big issues. I mean, if we could, through our compassion, save other beings, then that would be a fine topic to focus on. But the problem is that each of us suffers because of our own lack of skill in dealing with pain. And if we'd be willing to learn from the pain, then each of us could take care of our problems and there wouldn't be issues in life. So as you meditate, keep reminding yourself that you're preparing yourself so that you can deal intelligently and insightfully with the issues of pain, suffering, dis-ease in body and mind, particularly in mind. It's pain in the body, it turns out, is not the issue. We make it the issue and we have to deal with it in the course of the practice. But we deal with pain in the body because it relates to the anguish and suffering in the mind. Because if it were simply the fact that when a pain in the body arises, it just arises on its own, doesn't get connected to any suffering or dis-ease in the mind, then it wouldn't be an issue. The problem is the mind, however, has laid claim to the body. After all, it needs the body in order to manipulate the world to get what it wants out of it. So it has a sense of ownership, or at least tries to assert ownership. But then it turns out that the thing it wants to own, the thing it wants to manipulate, has problems. And so it's stuck. Can't really let go, but can't really control it. As the Buddha pointed out, your sense of self comes from this sense of control. And to some extent we can control the body. That's why we have this sense of that it's ours. or that it's us. But then you run into the fact that the, your control is not complete. And 
And this is the source of a lot of the conversations and arguments and complaints in the mind. Why is this? As the Buddha once said, our normal reaction to pain is twofold. One, bewilderment. Why is this happening? And then secondly, the desire to find somebody who knows a way out of this pain. And because those two tendencies occur together, the bewilderment plus the search, the search tends to go off in the wrong directions. Like the story they tell of the man who jumped on his horse and ran off in every direction, rode it off in every direction. The mind thrashes around, grasping at this, grasping at that. So the, this is the Buddha's contribution. So, okay, here's a way to end the bewilderment so that your search actually leads to the end of suffering. And in the course of that, you'll also find other issues get settled as well. Suffering is like the watering hole in the savanna. If you're going to out to shoot a documentary on the animals in the savanna, you don't have to chase them all over the savanna. For the most part, you wouldn't find them. They'd see you coming and they'd hide. But if you station your camera next to the watering hole, everybody's going to have to come at some point or another during the day. And it's the same with pain and suffering. All the issues in the mind will gather around here, and that's where you get to see them. And if you're in the right position, which is what we're trying to create here as we meditate, put the mind in a position where it has enough sense of security and solidity through its practice of mindfulness and concentration, you can resist your normal reaction to pain, or at least you can drop the normal reaction to pain and react to it in a new way. As the Buddha said, the way beyond suffering is to comprehend it. And comprehending means that you understand it so thoroughly that you can let it go. You develop a sense of dispassion for it. So to comprehend it means you have to watch it again and again and again. And the more you watch it, the more you learn. This ability to learn is an important part of the meditation. When you meditate, you're not simply putting the mind through the meat grinder, i.e. imposing a particular technique on it that's supposed to do all the work for you. The technique puts the mind in a position where it can observe itself, where it can observe its tendencies. And learn from what it watches. This involves feedback loops. In other words, you react to the pain in a certain way, or you deal with the pain in a certain way, and then you watch, see what happens. And then you do it again, see what happens again. And after a while you realize you've watched enough to realize that this particular approach doesn't work, then you stop to say, well, what other approach would work? Because this is how you learn about things. You don't just sit there and look at them. You poke them. It's like coming across a a little animal in the forest, and it's all curled up. So you poke it a little bit, see what happens. Is it alive? Is it not alive? If you really want to learn about it, sometimes you take it into the laboratory. I remember years back, first experiment in biology class was to take some little rabbits and put them in a box glass box, and then change the amount of oxygen in the box to see how the rabbit's respiration responded. Afterwards, I really felt sorry for the rabbits. We didn't torment them. But you learn something by changing the amount of oxygen in the air. You, you saw that the less oxygen there was and the more rapidly they breathed. The more oxygen, the more slow their breath. In other words, you change the conditions and see what happens as a result. That's how you learn. So it's this ability, one, to act, and two, to observe. That's how we learn about things. 
If you simply acted without observing, you'd be like a machine. Or if you could simply observe but without acting. You wouldn't know anything for sure. Things would come and things would go, and you wouldn't know what the connections were. So you learned how to sit here and watch and do things with the pain. And sometimes doing the things means simply treating it with equanimity, trying not to identify with it, simply watching it as an event that comes and goes. That is a kind of action. You've decided to take that approach, and then you watch what happens as a result. And then you'll notice that there are changes in the pain. Sometimes it flares up, sometimes it dies down. Sometimes the mind is perfectly fine, other times the mind is aggravated, irritated by the pain. Well, what happened? When the aggravation comes, what came along with the aggravation? When the aggravation goes, what went along with that? Pose the question. Even the posing of a question is a kind of action. It's a part of your experiment with the pain. And then watch to see what's coming and going along with the, the mental anguish. This is why the Buddha has us divide things into the aggregates, because it's the coming and going of perceptions, the coming and going of thought fabrications. And that's going to have an impact on the pain. You see that the perception, the label you place on the pain, acts like a bridge. Certain perceptions come and they make the anguish flare up. When you can catch that happening, you realize see, the perception does not have to be there. Anything that arises can pass away. So in this way you poke the pain. You change the environment around the pain so you can learn about how it acts. And that way you learn about it. So it's a combination of the doing and the watching. That's the feedback loop. And the watching helps you change the doing. And the doing helps you understand what's connected with what. And you see a lot of the narratives of your life, a lot of your worldviews come flaring up. I once had a very sad conversation with a man who had been a martial arts expert and be able to do amazing things with his body. And yet, as he got older, he developed a really bad arthritis. And he was convinced that God was doing this to him. And of course, the idea of God, the creator of the universe, was dumping on him. That's a horrible story to carry around with you, a horrible worldview to carry around with you. And he wouldn't let it go. So of course he was going to suffer. So you have that kind of worldview, it makes it difficult to look at the pain with curiosity, simply with the desire to comprehend it. Because you're also carrying around the idea that the universe as a whole, the basic principle underlying the universe, is dumping on you in an unfair way. But if you simply have the attitude, well, whatever comes up that causes pain and suffering, I'm going to let that go. You quickly see which narratives aggravate the pain and which ones are helpful. Which worldviews aggravate the pain, which ones are helpful. That's why this humble topic of pain can start addressing a lot of the bigger issues that you carry around. So as you deal with pain, both physical and mental, in your practice, realize it's, it's not something you just want to push out of the way or get past or you can get onto the real work. Dealing with the pain is the real work. And all the other issues in your life are going to come gathering around here as well, and you'll be able to see them in action. They're all part of that complex that you want to comprehend to the point where you can gain dispassion and let go. 
whatever is causing the suffering, you let go of that. At the same time, you develop the qualities and allow you to stay there and watch and probe and learn. So you don't get overwhelmed with the desire to push the pain away or get rid of it. You've got yourself in a position where you can watch for long periods of time, not load yourself down with the pain. The other day we were talking about dealing with aggravations that last for hours and hours. Well, one of the tricks of dealing with an aggravation that lasts for hours and hours is not to think about the hours and hours. The pain's been here for two hours. Don't think about the past two hours of pain. Think about what is there right now, right now, right now. When you're in how much longer is this going to last, hey, don't ask. How much longer will I have to sit here? Don't ask. Simply asking that creates that story, that world in your mind. It's going to weigh things down. If you deal just with the pain in the present moment, it doesn't weigh the mo present moment down to the point where it's going to break. So if you allow yourself to be humble enough to deal just with, just with what's going on in the present moment, to watch when the pain comes and when it goes and what comes and goes along with it. You find that your willingness to be humble will open things up to something really special.